The world's rivers are being dammed now faster than ever. In response to this, a group of paddlers set out on a one-year journey to document what could be the last descent. We will fight for water. We will fight for survival. survival. Fight for the survival we will of our fight children. For life. That is important. As a kayaker, the best thing for me is to get back to those places where the rivers run free. It's just the kind of the hype around the villages. Everybody's talking about how, you know, they're going to have to move and get displaced, and they're offering these settlements for just like almost no money and just basically forcing them out of their homes. While the situation today is critical, its story has already been told. In the United States, it was during the 20th century that frenzied dam development took place. Famous conservationist John Muir fought these projects, including the damming of Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite National Park. While he lost that battle, the death of Hetch Hetchy has a silver lining. Its loss inspired others to fight for places like the Grand Canyon which are still free-flowing today because of these efforts. It's Hetch Hetchy's story and the growing movement of individuals fighting to save free-flowing rivers that led Katie Scott, Charlie Center, and Scott Laguerre to embark on this journey. They set out to Nepal, India, and Uganda, which are struggling with the same challenges the West faced 70 years ago. I think it's this great opportunity right now for these developing countries to look at the mistakes that we have made and in turn for us to learn from those people who have found a way to live sustainably within their environment. The paddler's first destination was Nepal and the world-renowned Marciandi River. Right away when you get off the plane, you're totally immersed in Nepalese culture with beautiful colors and big mountains. I can't wait to see the Marciandi River. Nearly all of the rivers in Nepal are threatened because of the power needs of neighboring China and India, the two most populated countries in the world. The paddlers chose to explore the Marciandi River because its spectacular scenery, amazing whitewater, and ecological diversity are already being destroyed by dam construction. They invited longtime California boater Eric Conklin to join them. We hired porters for the first half of our hike. The Marciandi River follows along the popular Annapurna trekking route. Local porters along the way will carry people's stuff up over these huge mountain passes in the Himalayas. We've made it a little ways down the trail and they see one of the guys coming along with a goat. With the money the kayakers paid them, the porters bought a goat to feed their families. The goat didn't always cooperate. The entire economy in this area is based on tourism, the number one industry in Nepal. Damming up these rivers is going to take that away from them. Small tea houses along the way provide uh, shelter and food for the trekkers and kayakers. We made it, Landruk, finally. We got a little friends with us here, some leeches on our feet. Run, run for your life! <laughs> We're gonna sleep here in the lodge tonight and hopefully make it to put in tomorrow. 
After two days of trekking with their kayaks, the paddlers finally get to the river. We're ready for a nice five or six days of paddling now. Paddlers were so enamored with this place, they just couldn't contain their enthusiasm. Marciandi is the greatest river on earth. Hands down, look at this place. just got uh, pulled to the side of the river by security guards. There are currently three hydro projects being built on the Marciandi, and they're all being financed by foreign interests. When they're complete, it will effectively drown and dewater the entire river valley, leaving few options for the people who live there. We don't need power. We don't need power. We don't need power. They build the dam, they need to be talked to the local people. But the government is not uh, attending to the people. Please, stop the dam, make clean the river. This is a perfect place for kayaking, an exciting place. a common theme throughout Nepal and that is that there is a respect and a connection with nature and the people living alongside the river are so content. We feel happy. Nearly 90 percent of Nepal's population is rural. In these places energy needs are met by sustainable micro hydro projects and catching the sun's rays for solar power. We're going to walk down the main road and try to put back in below the dam, try to paddle like one of the best stretches of white water to the paddle house. This section of river will be dry upon completion of the Marciandi's second hydro project. As the paddlers made their way down the Marciandi, they stopped at different villages where the locals were happy to give them food and shelter. We found some very friendly people who are going to cook us some noodles. My name is Grandma. And then we're <laughs> going to keep paddling. Been two months in Nepal. Packing up, headed toward India. We're gonna be using the buses and the trains. Should be fun. Instead of flying, the paddlers decided to take advantage of the elaborate overland transportation network that runs between Nepal and India. Been on a lot of bus rides now. This has to be up there with one of the sketchiest ones ever. We were told first to carry our kayaks all the way down to one end of the train to load it on that car and then when we got there they told us we had to carry them all the way back to the front of the train and right about when the train was about to blow its horn and roll out of the station we ended up just shoving them into an open door into the bathroom so as we hurled down the tracks our kayaks were just kind of sticking a couple feet out of the train. 
India is a country one-third the size of the United States, but with a population of over one billion people. Rapid development has left many people in the dark due to constant load shedding and power outages. The government's solution is to build 168 large dams in the Brahmaputra River Basin, which flows through the northeastern state of Arunachal Pradesh, one of the most pristine areas left in the Himalayas. It's home to over 30 tribes of indigenous people that live sustainably in their environment. The Brahmaputra River originates at 22,000 feet on Mount Kailash, the holiest of all Himalayan peaks. Known as the Sang Po in Tibet, it flows east before whipping around the Big Bend and then plunging into the deepest gorge on Earth. It is a main vein. It's the only river that, that slices straight through the Himalayas. And, and by the time it actually makes it to the Bay of Bengal, it's the sixth largest river in the world. When it leaves Tibet and crosses into India, the river takes on yet another name. Known as the Siang in its upper stretches, it finally becomes the mighty Brahmaputra when it hits the massive floodplain of the Indian subcontinent. Today, it remains undammed along its entire 1,800 miles. But with India's plan for 168 dams, its free-flowing status lies in the balance. Uh, India, we worship rivers. Rivers are gods and mostly goddesses, like mothers. If they're not flowing, they're dead. Arunachal has living rivers. The Brahmaputra is a living river. After a long train ride, the paddlers meet up with the second half of the team. Their first goal, to paddle the low hit, one of the main tributaries to the Brahmaputra. I was back and going. Pretty good. It's always amazing we could fit all of this stuff inside of our kayaks. Such a small little area. So we just finished packing up um, for the Low Hit River last night and early this morning, and we have all kinds of food, sleeping bags, overnight gear, pretty much everything that you could possibly need for um, a five to six day trip. So right now we're ready to put on. on the river with you know some of my best friends and some of the best paddlers in the world and one of the coolest places in the world at least that I've ever been um, and just spending five days self-support trip running just amazing awesome white water and there's you know every day was a little bit different but every day just seemed to build and a short way into the run the paddlers came upon a few members of the Miss Me tribe one of the largest indigenous communities in the Brahmaputra Basin. And then this gentleman here is a native tribal member of the Mismi tribe. This, this whole area is Mismi. This whole area. And then when we get further south of Pasigat, the tribe will change. It'll be Adi. So the Mismi and Adi tribes, they've had a long history here, thousands of years. Um, so there's, there's a lot of interesting stories between the two of them. A lot of intermarriage, some wars, but okay. and today was day two on the low hit from the rapids. Today we're just totally amazing. We had one incident where Nobody scouted and all of a sudden we dropped into it and there was this huge rock with the big pillow and I started surfing it. Meanwhile, chaos and boats were flying and enders were happening and things were going down. But uh, all good, we, we made it and uh, we're right in the middle of the hardest section of the river and we get to wake up and we got some more action in the morning.
How's that bowl working out for you, Eric? Dude, it's awesome. <laughs> Multi-use rum bottle. <laughs> it's got a little handle. Hold on. After five days in the pristine, untouched canyons of the low hit, the paddlers awoke to the harsh realities threatening the river. Just arrived at the takeout here and um, right away I noticed a surveyor right underneath the bridge came up and sure enough there's a whole crew here that are scouting the whole area for a dam that's going to be built within the next uh, couple years. Pretty much two dams that's going to take out the whole section of river that we just did. And um, it's really interesting sitting there talking to them and getting their perspective on it. And so you guys want to build a dam here? Yes. It, it will be the largest, what to say, idle project in India. It's a project of 3,000 megawatt. To put that in perspective, that's 30% more power than produced by Hoover Dam. So we are trying to exploit this part. With the low hits future grim, the paddlers loaded up for the three-day journey to the Siang, the main fork of the Brahmaputra. While the rivers were wild enough, Driving in India was an adventure all its own. The moon's coming up, and uh, it's Lizzie's birthday. Oh yeah, we're stuck in the middle of a creek. <laughs> Happy birthday. Some people arrive with a tractor called John Deere. <laughs> right. Indian John Deere. No, it's a Mahindra. Mahindra. Just arrived here in Tuting. We did a 20 hour car ride in the last day. Six of us crammed into one rig. And our goal is to get to the end of the road and hike a couple more miles upstream before putting in for the six day trip on the Siang. Threatened by two large-scale hydro projects, the Siang has attracted the attention of international conservation groups. It uh, should be pretty awesome. We're packed for a couple nights, and then we're meeting a raft about probably 70 or 80 k downstream, and then going out three more days. go 14, 15 days just out of your kayak living simply, but you're always moving, you know, you're always just, and it, and a lot of times it doesn't take much effort. You're just sitting out in the middle of the river and these rivers are hauling through just, it could be flat, it could be class two, you know, but then there's tons of white water in there, big white water. Thank you. 
doesn't get any better than this. Having everything in the back of your boat and just pulling into camp with all great friends and making a big fire and cooking over the fire. Perfect, perfect evenings. Give it cheeky like a wife, him rock and fly him wife, no monkey. Him in fight like a wife, make him wife go like a hospital. All the kid been cry, they been a bomb, no maja. So we just met up with Roland here and uh, the rest of the rafters and he's set up a pretty cool program where he's gotten people from the local communities to all get involved and he's teaching them all how to raft guide so we'll be spending the next six days going down the river with them. The philosophy is that if you, if you show people that they can have a livelihood from a healthy river system and if you give them jobs and you start promoting the tourism and when it comes to the day that you know they vote on whether they're going to build a dam there or not you're at least creating some sort of voice that is going to support conservation along the way they sampled some of the river's unique delicacies so this is a local bug here in Arenacho that people eat. It's called the tari. It's called the tari. It smells kind of like baked almonds. He's just teaching me how to eat it here. Inside has this red paste that's really spicy, so he's removing the spice. OK, so first you squeeze the juice. Yeah, a little bit from the, no, no, Don't shoot in your eye. Little bit. Yeah. Oh! Oh! You remove that. OK, did I get it all? Yeah, you get it all. You What's would. that? White stuff. That's the. That's, that's the, the good. That's, that's the, the good. Meat. It's ready to go. Yeah, it's ready to go. Okay. Chew it. Chew it. Mmm. <laughs> Hydropower is one of the most clean forms of creating energy. At the same time, you don't want to just dam everything. Right now, the plans in the government of India are to get power out of every possible gradient. There's a, a few things that, that we're really working on, which are um, the protection of the Sang River corridor, designating that whole river as a like a biosphere reserve and, and protecting it. You know, there's no chance that we're going to be able to, to protect the whole, all every river in Arunachal. There's just no way. There's, it's too valuable to the to the you know the interests like the hydropower corporation and the cities that need all that power. But at the same time, there are certain rivers out there that really do deserve protection. And you know, if we can save one river and have people out there getting on it and experiencing that, you know, the, the beauty of a free flowing river, then it'll at least be something. The paddlers visited with government officials to hear why Arunachal needs so many dams. How many people are going to be displaced? Very few people. Very, very few. Mm -hmm. Because here uh, it is a uh, thinly populated area uh -huh. and very few people are there. Local activists disagree. Certainly it's, it's a complete misleading argument to say that Dams in Arunachal Pradesh are win-win because the population being displaced are small. Small populations of indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. So the displacement will have to be looked at in the context of their populations and not looked at in the context of what is India's population. It's pretty classical. We've seen this. You take a native population, a small native population, they lose their land. The people who are displaced get money. They go and work in the factories, they die of disease, they lose all social balance, they take to the bottle. My name is uh, Nino, Nino Dai, I'm a Pasi. We have a lot of different tribes, so I'm from the Pasi sub-tribe. 
Okay, the population of Arunachal is around 1.2 to 1.3 million, of which I think uh, 675,000 is tribal. The indigenous people from this state. Uh, people are not even many people are not even aware of what the outside world looks like. So they are content here, living in the forests, in the mountains. People are actually quite innocent. They are quite innocent here. Okay, then we have no nature. It's a place where there is something going, sustainable, and how do we improve on that rather than replace that? So that's what's really special about this place. They've been living with the rivers, the special people. The river gives them everything. What about the what about the people that live along the river? Will they have to move? No, they can be relocated anywhere. It will be easy for us just to relocate, relocate wherever this submerged area comes. So where do you think they would be relocated to? No, that can be considered in the later part. As a kayaker, I can feel a little bit like native people. We're at the mercy of the river. Brahmaputra. <laughs> Leaving India to head for Africa, the paddlers were inspired by the individuals they had met who were still fighting for their rivers and hopeful that they would be able to return to this magical land to paddle again. Scott and Katie arrived in Uganda and the heart of Africa, home to the source of the Nile, the longest river in the world. It's crazy how just from a five hour plane ride, you can go from a culture like India, go from Bombay to Uganda and just be in a completely different world. You know, the people look so different, the people are eating completely different food, speaking a totally different language, and yet they're, they're going through the same struggles. The Bujigali Hydroelectric Project will dam the White Nile just 10 miles below its source at Lake Victoria. Like in Nepal, it's being financed with overseas money to send power to the highest bidder. The project has already dewatered one of the river's three channels while swallowing one of the White Nile's best rapids. The paddlers set out to run the White Nile's remaining stretches, world renowned for its gigantic whitewater and epic surf waves. four of us here today. Pretty trashy. Uh, I'm just getting ready to go get my ass kicked myself. So stay tuned. Well, I've been up and down these same damn roads and nothing ever seems to change. And, uh, you go a little older than one day the strange becomes mundane. Well, I don't know how folks can do it day after day. What does it feel like? You first get to the Nile and maybe Probably the first rapid you see is Bujigali Falls and you're standing there on the shore and it's just as huge, but there's just so much water pumping through that spot. And, uh, when you get in there and actually start kayaking down it, those waves are, look even taller once you're in there.
while the play on the White Nile is world class, its rapids have serious consequences, as Katie found out. About five hours since I uh, had my encounter with the croc, and um, came out pretty, pretty okay. I mean, nothing too major. I'm broken paddle, but. That's pretty understandable because I was beating him so hard, just bam, bam, bam. So um, he was pissed after that. I just did a flat water loop right on top of his head. And uh, that's what killed him. <laughs> While the paddlers took their lumps at the hands of the river in stride, the locals along the White Nile won't be able to shake off the effects of the Bujigali Dam so easily. Worrying where am I going to get a job for, for getting my people something to eat? Where am I going to get money to take my children to the hospital? Where am I going to get money if I lose my job? No way. If, if the dam, they, they build the dam, we're going to get power. But if you have, you don't have a job, you no, know, you, you you can't you can't afford to get that power. I suppose some my young sister, my young brother, take them school. So when the dam is being built, so and then I become unemployed, so many people will suffer. I'll suffer, and my family will suffer. So I'm all right. While nearly all of the locals the paddlers talked to were opposed to the dam. Government officials welcomed the development and the dollars it would bring into their coffers. And of course the community welcomed it, allowing the dam to be built within here so that at least the better life can be brought to us and with that better living. While the dam's proponents say it will provide local jobs, only 10% of dam workers will come from within the local community. Are employed here. At the moment, they are about 500. It's envisioned that there'll be about 1,500. It's estimated there'll be about 1,500 people. And how many of those are, are people from the local community? Um, the expatriates are at peak. I expect it to be about 150 to 200. So when they came in and told us that they are going to construct a dam, they told us that they will give us jobs as people who were affected by the dam. But at the end of the day, they are bringing other people from different areas. They leave us to suffer yet, they blocked away our jobs. Perhaps the saddest aspect of the Bujigali project is that there is another underutilized dam just upstream. You know, it was a crisis situation that really triggered the final approval of the Bujigali Dam. We all know that there's alternatives, and we all know that they could have perhaps held back and improved the existing system. So really, that's the tragedy here, and it's something that's repeated all over the world. It's a very convincing, very powerful uh, financial institutions, along with uh, dam constructors who are just looking to build a dam, regardless of whether it's needed or not. By then, we be arriving in front of the blasting With a project this size, it just appears everyone's blind as to what's going on. Like, we can't get a straight answer. Time scales, what's happening, when's happening, nobody knows. Dynamite's just devastating. I mean, the blasting down there, they, where they blast actually was one of the biggest cormorant nesting areas in the world. Literally, I would go down in the morning and there would be 6,000, 7,000 cormorants nesting in the islands down there. There's not one in sight now. Despite their uncertain future, the Ugandans exhibited a joy for living that was irrepressible and inspiring to the paddlers who met them. 
the people, the local people are just so welcoming and friendly. They have huge smiles on their faces and they just, you know, they want to learn about where we're from, just like we want to know what their life is about. And you can just have great conversations and do fun activities with these local people that rely on the river as their livelihood. Oh, that's a beauty, huh? Talapia. That is Talapia. So it's been amazing spending the last month here on the Nile and seeing the struggle of the dam, seeing how people's lives are going to be altered, you know, for better or for worse. It's been, it's been incredible. It's been really eye-opening in a lot of ways. I kind of have this surreal feeling packing up and, you know, after five months being on the road, Scott and I are finally headed back to California. While this section of the White Nile is doomed, hopefully its loss can inspire others to fight against two more dams being planned downstream, just as the destruction of Hetch Hetchy led to other rivers being saved. <laughs> Currently home to over 1,400 dams, large-scale dam construction in California reached its peak in the 1950s amid enormous population growth and a never-ending need for water and power. But by the 1970s, as environmental and political awareness of dams' impacts came to a head, dam construction in California virtually ceased. Still, the legacy of dam building in California means that today, every river draining the peaks of the Sierra Nevada mountains ends in a reservoir. As the group of paddlers arrived home, they set out to paddle those sections of rivers that remain untouched. As spring turned to summer, the paddlers shifted their focus back to Yosemite National Park to paddle the Grand Canyon of the Tuolumne, one of John Muir's most treasured Sierra rivers, whose upper stretches still run free above the drowning trench of Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. The goal? To take a trip into the past and witness firsthand the wonders that John Muir dedicated his life to preserving. Because the river is closed to kayaking in Yosemite, they had to keep a low profile. It's about 7 o'clock and uh, we're driving up to put in for the Grand Canyon that's swallowed me. We're about four hours away and once we get there we're going to put in tonight. Pretty excited. It's not often we put on the river at, uh, what do we got, quarter to one in the morning. But uh, I think it's going to be worth it. Freezing. Tired. What time is it? It's time for 5.30. So I guess it's actually crunch time straight off the bat. It dawned on me why we're not supposed to be kayaking here in Yosemite National Park. It's freaking simple. We're just not worthy. I mean, straight up, we're not worthy. Take a look at that horizon line. Yes. <laughs> you guys all wish you were here, don't you? <laughs> the risks for the paddlers were clear. If spotted, they would face fines, confiscation of their gear, and possible jail time, 
simply for paddling on what's left of this majestic river. When we got to the bottom of the trail, we uh, heard a really loud air horn going off and somebody screaming a bunch of stuff. I think that's a bear horn. A bear horn. Bear horn. Let's get the bears away in the morning. Yeah. Fuck, put the shits up, man. got down to here safely. We didn't get kicked off by the ranger. And right now we're camped above Muir Gorge, which is just around the corner. And we have pretty high water flow, so none of us really feel like dropping in there. So we're end up portaging on this trail, probably about two miles, up maybe a thousand feet, five, 500 feet above the river and then drop back into it. And by then we should be about six miles from the residue. So getting close. You wish we had a map? <laughs> the paddlers agreed that of all the rivers they had paddled, few were as scenic and beautiful as the Grand Canyon of the Tuolumne. As the group of longtime friends paddled the last free-flowing rapids on the Tuolumne, it signaled the end of a nine-month journey, which had taken them to the far corners of the globe. The paddlers had finally come full circle to the spot in California that inspired their journey, the place where large-scale dam development in California began at Hetch Hetchy Reservoir a century ago. Yet. As tragic as the loss of Hetch Hetchy Valley is today, its drowning actually led to other rivers being saved. Dinosaur National Monument on Utah's Green River and even the iconic Grand Canyon of the Colorado River still exist in their undammed states today because people fought to keep them on the surface of the earth and not buried under miles of water. The idea seemed to be that conservation consisted of building dams. And some of them are good, but we've overdone it. And we've forgotten the importance of wild rivers. While Hetch Hetchy signaled the beginning of over 60 years of large-scale dam building in California, since the building of New Malonis Dam, which destroyed the pristine Stanislaw River in the 1970s, not one additional large-scale dam has been built in the Golden State. Once people saw rivers, they came to appreciate them for the resource that they were as they were and not just something to be buried behind a large dam and provide water for urban areas and agricultural fields. The final realization by individuals that rivers are a resource in their natural state led the people of California to choose to actively protect these amazing places. Maybe their efforts can help others see that if large-scale dam projects continue in places like India, Nepal, and Africa, the world will be poorer in ways that can't be measured by revenue dollars or kilowatt hours produced. Organizations such as American Whitewater, Friends of the River, and the Sierra Club continue to fight to remove these ill-conceived dams and restore these rivers and canyons from their watery graves. Today we are actually going to hill visits, which means we're meeting with staffers or individual congressmen and senators from across the country. We're meeting with people from California, Montana, Washington, uh, a number of other great whitewater states. And uh, we're going to talk to them about energy policy and why uh, basically we shouldn't build new dams to uh, prevent climate change. Yeah, you know, I think, I think probably the most important single thing I've learned is the power of one or two or three people to quite literally change the world. I mean, when you make a commitment that you really care about something and you invest in what you care about, it changes the way the people around you look at it. If people do continue to fight and pay attention to what's happening to rivers at home as well as around the world, 
this doesn't have to be the last descent. on the river but well maybe not even about feeling man my ass is really hurting like from all the spicy doll bot combined with wiping my ass with leaves for about a week <laughs> you got it <laughs> We're just sitting on the broken bus. Can we have coffee? <laughs> <laughs> so we decided to stop before the bus blew up. I think that was a good call. A little mixed up with, um, you know, some lighter fluid that Lizzie brought, <laughs> and uh, you know, we didn't think that it would be kind of as. Everybody seems to like uh, give me crap for it too. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny? What's so funny? <laughs> Dude, you should get your bag up there, bro. Hike up here was savage. I'm sweating like a pig. We're at the movies. <laughs> Aranchal Local Cinema. Girls come up with these scenarios and they read these books and it's like the perfect scenario for them. But then what I think, like in all reality, is what, I know, you know, I know the female brain. <laughs> okay? You didn't read the book. And, the, you know, the book is great, but it's not real. See, like inside, inside the female brain, a girl really wants a guy to not be sympathetic, to not come over, and that's what really gets the girl's attention at the end of the day. Too tired. My paddle broke off. Scott's dropped. I just had a damn close call, that's for sure. Jacob Scott, Uganda, Africa. Favorite moment was meeting Ben. Okay. Love at first sight. 